Our next session will be on the 26th of April. Uh, it will be uh, fully online. Uh, we will have Giorgio Venizelos, uh, and we, we, he will uh, uh, talk about populism and anti-populism uh, in the age of fake news. It will be at two, not at uh, six. So we, we always have sessions on the Wednesday, uh, and, but at different times in the afternoon. So now it's time for me to, uh, to, to introduce our today guest. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we are very happy to have you here and that you accepted our invitation. Uh, Anna De Lille, she's Professor of Human-Computer Interaction uh, and Director of the Research at the Knowledge Media Institute of the Open University in UK. And her, as you know, because I was already talking, uh, mentioning her, your, her, her work with you in these days, uh, she works, she foc or her research focuses mostly on the study of collective intelligence and how it can facilitate the um, new, can be facilitated through the new forms of dialogue uh, and deliberation. She leads the Intelligent Deliberation Group, uh, which investigates uh, theories, methods, and tools accounting for the centrality of social interaction and discourse in public engagement, urban informatics, e-democracy, and social innovation context, uh, which is which are all areas very important for for our studies here at Tishkete. In the past 15 years, Anna led uh, the design and development of eight different collective intelligence technologies, such as Core, the Evidence Hub, LightMap, the Bat Hub, um, Clad Hasbord, uh, and Democracy Reflection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see all of them in her uh, page uh, that uh, I shared with you. Um, and Anna working in many different contexts. And, um, and today she will be presenting um, about, uh, her presentation will be about this, uh, these issues, these topics, uh, and the title will be the new technologies for the liberty democracy at scale, new technologies for the, um, a discourse-based discourse collective intelligence uh, research and applications perspectives. So now I, uh, it's my time to, uh, to go to, to, uh, to the audience and to invite here uh, Anna. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. I will uh, just stop sharing um, this. Uh, um, the, my screen and to share your PowerPoint. Okay, I think it's like this. Yes. Hello. I can't see myself, but I hope that people online can see me. No, nada. Uh, can you see me and hear me online? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much for being here today, and um, and thanks, Kuya, for inviting me uh, to this seminar series, which indeed is quite impressive. That you have not missed one month since two thousand fourteen. <laughs> it's really a very interesting topic. <clears throat> Uh, and really great to be here. Uh, so today I am going to talk about deliberation technologies. Um, I hope that by the end of this talk you have, if you have not already, an idea of what they are and uh, why I believe these are very, very important new technologies to shape the democracy of the future. So, um, what is the problem that we are trying to focus on and tackle? Um, as your seminar demonstrates, uh, there is many evidence that uh, society is in unrest. Um, political de decisions are made almost in the blind and what has happened with the COVID pandemics policies and uh, with the war in Ukraine 
It's just showing us that consequences can happen when happen when happen when happen when happen. I I like a rap, but I don't think this is. I like. Oh, can you ah, please online everyone mute yourself, please? But I think sure it wasn't something happening here in the speaker. It was someone talking at home. Okay, okay. Yeah, it was someone talking. Yeah, it seems so. So very negative consequences can happen when uh, political decisions are made without really anticipating citizen feeling and an understanding of complex societal problems. And uh, of course, the way I go, uh, you know, around this problem is identifying a key issues in the lack of spaces for us as a society to come together and really discuss in a civilized, open, and uh, an inclusive way the problems that we are all facing. So it's really like evident to me that at all societal level, we don't have the spaces for doing that. And we don't have a way to come together and discuss and perhaps even make decisions uh, in a very democratic way about the future of our cities and of our society. So I look in particular at technologies that can help mediate this problem and in particular deliberation technology. So deliberation, you are political uh, scientists, right? So you will know more than me, but from, uh, it's a mix, but from how I understand it, uh, is really the careful discussion uh, that happened before decisions are made. So it's a thorough dialogical assessment of all the pro and con of different measure because before we decide something. So when we are all distributed in different places, spaces, cities, when group, people, organization, countries, they are distributed geographically, and people cannot come together to discuss and make decisions. So how do we do it? So what, what are the means? What are the spaces in which we come together and we discuss and make decisions together? There are none. De, fa de facto, the only space we see available is social media and the web. So indeed, uh, these spaces are really poor. And there is a, a, a an extensive literature in the computer science field that I would suggest you to look at if you are interested to know more about this, uh, that really demonstrate how social media are really inappropriate as, uh, as technology to support healthier, productive, inclusive, democratic deliberations. And the reason for this are from one side very technical and from another side very uh, social and organizational. So from a technical perspective, I am a technologist, so I also look at the design of the tool itself and the user experience that it facilitates. Um, social media really are very rudimental in the way they structure and represent discussion data. So uh, they really lack uh, any uh, features for uh, uh, structuring and helping the participants to make sense, to better understand, to identify where idea uh, contrasts, to identify and understand what the state and progress of a discussion. Um, so they really lack any features that help um, really understanding and situating yourself into an online discussion. From an organizational and social point of view, uh, of course, we all know that this system, so unstructured, uh, they produce very, very, very damaging and negative uh, uh, social dynamics, like, for example, eco chamber, the activation of bias information dynamics, homophily, 
and the lack of diversity, uh, shallow content, uh, and of course, very bad situation of hate speech, division, polarization, conflict, uh, getting to a point that they become really unsafe space in which social tolerance uh, is basically in existence. So let's look at them. So many of these systems are look at, at technological side of it. They are really time centric, a, a timeline sequences of posts. There is no insight or insight on any logical linking apart the time sequences between these posts. Uh, the content is very scattered. There are uh, various research that says how it's repeated. There are the same concept repeated many times and there is no way to identify them. Um, and really there is no way for anyone to understand if any of the content shares as any evidence of truth and there is any logical evidence supporting what is being shared. They also support very, very poor debate in the sense that they don't give any space for disagreement. And I'm now asking myself, how can we all agree all the time in a society that is so diverse for value, colors, taste, need? So how can we use technologies that don't allow you to come together with our diversity and disagree on the complex problem we have if we don't have a way to disagree on them in a civilized way? Of uh, course, in this technology, Anna, yeah. Uh, your slides are not passing. We are only seeing the same picture, or the slides oh. are frozen. Someone is saying. Um, okay. Um. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Uh. So, shall I stop sharing and sharing again? Share this. Share. Do you see anything? Ah, uh, now it seems to be. Now we're seeing your screen. Not exactly what's being uh, passed in the in the um, at the wall in the wall. We try again. Thank you, Tiago. So it was this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or this one. No, this one. What do you see now? Ah. Uh. It's hmm. so. Which in which slide are you now? Reward popularity. Can you yes, can you see that's, a yellow yeah. highlight? Yeah. yeah. Reward that's popularity always. versus critical thinking. What we see is basically that when you have uh, two uh, two two screens, right? That you see the main oh, screen. Oh, I see, you see what you mean. You see the, you know, like the next slide and the notes, mm. et cetera. You see, that's what we're seeing now. I don't know how to not see the, the notes, uh, the presenter view. I think you. It's is, probably the, the the, view, but I don't know. Probably you have two screens. When you select the screens, you have two screens. You right, have but you can, uh, you can, uh, in, a, in any case, even with two slides, you can follow, no? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. So yeah. I have two screens, yes, and do I have to share which one? But now we're seeing Second it. one, it's this fine. one. Yeah, yeah. Like this. Oh, perfect. Yeah? Yes. No, Thank I don't so see much. anything on my screen, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I have it's okay, I can do it. Uh, yes, now it's it's going. Sorry uh, for interrupting. And thank you. Collective intelligence. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't remember where it was. It's slide, okay. You find it. Okay. All right. <laughs> so all these hearts plus one and uh, uh, community feedback community appreciative only feedback are the main cause of polarization and, uh, and uh, uh, silo conversation online. 
And really they put together and they increase dynamic that really reward the popularity and homophily of thinking uh, rather than uh, uh, critical thinking about different points of view. So by design, they create the social division that we so much complain for. Uh, they also have no support for idea uh, refinement. So they have this classic problem of the solo ideation. So you can have and crowdsource ideas to many people, but there will be always one person idea, idea then competing with the other idea. So how do we actually co-create ideas in this space? How do I learn from what you tell me so that I can actually improve my ideas and perhaps bring our idea together? This doesn't really happen, even though this is a critical uh, condition in uh, deliberation, for deliberation, for healthy deliberation. So all these tools have really lots of limitations. And um, uh, about 15 years ago, um, to try to tackle them, a new class of online discussion uh, technology started to um, to be studies and proposed. And these are called issue-centric system. So these are systems that are basically built around discussion of problems rather than uh, ideations. And they build on argumentation theory and uh, uh, computer-supported uh, argument visualization. And they have uh, basically the main idea to help structuring the conversation as an argument map. So dividing the things we say, we say as idea, question, answer, and pro and con for those, and making it visible so that other people can build upon them. So when this started uh, many years ago, there were really not many argumentation technology out there, but I put there a link of a recent uh, uh, survey that has been done by the Canonical Debate Lab. And there are nowadays 168 different argumentation technologies. And this, I think it is, it is saying something. Uh, people are realizing that these technologies for healthier deliberation and argumentation are needed. And there are such a variety of them. They all have in, in common these little things I told you before. So they are trying to build a little semantic structure between uh, the dialogical elements that we exchange with each other. So not just classify the, the, the words we share online as posts, but let's try to say if we are actually trying to raise a question here or make a point or propose a solution or perhaps we are proposing a pro or a con argument to a solution proposed by someone else and this this very very simple structure has has proved to be very useful also for lay users so i wanted to share some very probably very famous cases of, of uh, argumentation technologies that you might know already. So the first one is Chialo. Uh, and uh, it, it really, it, it's all argumentation-based discussion of all sorts of kind. I really suggest you to go and check it out. It's one of my favorites. It has uh, uh, still this classification of uh, uh, problem and then uh, possible options and pro and con and a uh, lot of interesting features so like for example enable, enabling people to rank the impact that any idea or argument might have on the general conversation it allows people to move around other people idea if they are misplaced it allows people to refine each other idea providing the suggestion for improving their comments and different moderation features so that together the uh, the group can improve uh, the discussion. Another great example is consider it. Um, this is used widely, especially in the US for strategic planning and public engagement. Uh, in many different cities, it has been used for deciding, for example, specific urban solutions and open it to the, to the entire community for discussion. 
And the things I really love about this tool is the way in which um, it uh, shows and visually how people position themselves around the options. So you see all this bubble there are different people and how they agree and position themselves toward agreement or disagreement around what has been proposed on the top. And then the pro and con that have been uh, proposed by the participants uh, for that solution. And the things I really like the most is that you don't see one person in one place. You see the same person in many places. So, and just that opens up your mind. It makes you realize that you actually can have different pro and different composition for the same solution that you actually might be very close to someone because you agree against something and close to a person you never thought you were close to because you both because agree on something else. So it just really make you see that disagreeing is actually fine, is normal, that we are not polarized. And this in the nature actually of our diversity not to be. So, and, and this is polis and is probably also, you know, this one, it has been used all around the world by governments, academics. And, uh, oh, by the way, this one is very different from Chialo because this one allow you to deliberate on one option. So you really have one solution you are deliberating. Chialo allow open questions. So this is a great big difference. The same thing it goes for police. Police gives you one solution to discuss. So it's saying like, okay, shall we build a bridge here? And the answer is uh, yes or no. So this is just for deliberating yes, no questions. But it's a pretty cool tool because it's uh, the first tools that brought in uh, artificial intelligence um, in order to assess the uh, in a much more complex way uh, how we are close to each other um, in a, in a, in a basically an n-dimensional space in which we are compared on the base of how we agree and disagree on many different uh, claims. So all this tool that I've shown you and the one that I will show you before, uh, that I will show you later, they have a lot of advantages and the literature uh, demonstrates that really they help com communities to be much more systematic in the way they really look at complex problems, analyze them, much more open in assessing solution. It, it, it really, even though that could seem uh, counterintuitive, it is not, it, uh, it, does, uh, it does take them to discuss in a more civilized way and reduces conflict instead of uh, exacerbating them and really improves the quality, the overall quality of the argumentation processes, reducing the problem of the shallow content that we were talking before and the evidence-based reasoning. People are really in there focused on the issue they are debating and they are doing it, reducing a lot of the noise. But of course, they also have a lot of limitations, these technologies and, uh, and one of the biggest one is that uh, uh, historically uh, their interface for contribution are not very easy. They are not as easy as a forum to participate. And uh, they require some cognitive leap for people to learn how to use them. And this uh, takes a lot of people and communities and group off from using them more widely. Uh, so it causes that they often fit to scale to large, large conversation. And, um, and, and another big problem that some of the tool I show you start tackling is that when the conversation scale, they don't have a lot of support for making sense of the conversation, visualizing it, analyzing it, reporting on it, uh, and things like that. And of course, they also have the big, big project problem of being um, centralized. So, uh, well, this is probably for another talk. Um, 
so in my in my research and in my group, uh, we basically work uh, to improve uh, this shortcoming. And uh, in this research field, at the intersection between online deliberation, collective intelligence, and human dynamics of engagement. So what we do is, as I try to show you, we build from the limitation of the online dialogue, discussion, and deliberation technology out there. And we propose a new class of tool that use different form of computational analysis, structuring, visualization, and different forms of mapping and analytics to bring this new way of thinking and reflecting on the discussion data so that they can produce new way to uh, interact and come together around complex problems. So if we think about collective intelligence as a spectrum, so imagine like from collective sensing the environment, like uh, tools that you might have come across, like fix my strips or a lot of uh, uh, crowdsourcing uh, mapping tool. Like, I don't know if you are familiar with the, uh, I love the Justice Atlas, for example, the tracking and justice around the world. Or so where basically a lot of people come together to map complex problem to signal something that is not working. Uh, and then moving up to building on this collective intelligence and collective data to try making sense of this complex problem, to try to ideate how you, they can be sol solved. And then start to deliberate from all these possible solution, which one should we choose? How do we move from discussion to decision to action on a collective basis. So if we think of collective intelligence in this spectrum, we basically sit at the center. And while there are a lot going on on the two edges with social media use, for example, for collective action and mobilization and uh, collective sensing tools used, for example, for tracking, for tra using uh, humans and uh, urban sensors in smart cities, we really have not advanced technologically very much in the way in which we take this signal and we discuss about them, we make sense of them and we make collective decision. So this is basically what we've been working on for a few years. And I have been thinking about what tools should I show you? <laughs> and I can't show them all, so I'll pick three. Why three? Because um, uh, I wanted to give you the idea, uh, uh, an example, uh, the sense that uh, really for transforming deliberative democracy, uh, we don't need only one tool. It's impossible to do it in, with, in only one way because deliberative democracy happens at many scales. It happens at the scales of small, uh, civic organization, grassroots uh, organization that try to advocate with about specific problem, but it also happen at institutional level. While, for example, government try to engage citizens uh, in political election. And it also happened while we are deliberating online and discussing the problem of Ukraine. So how do we shift? What tool does it work? And I wanted to give you an example for each of these niche area, regime area, and in the middle. So the first tool is Lightmap. So uh, Lightmap is a tool for civic leaders. So civic leaders, imagine, are community activists. So they might have a specific vocation, specific organization, and they are trying to advocate uh, for that. And a great paper uh, that uh, came out in 2019 really distilled the struggle that this often volunteer uh, have to cope with uh, to advocate uh, for their causes. And the main problem were, that they identified were the lack of collaborative tool to, un to analyze large quantity of qualitative data out there and also the, the, the lack of tool 
for them in group to make sense of what is going on and to analyze and visualize their community inputs to try to understand where the community is going. So imagine Lightmap as a tool that helped them doing that. So it, it, were, it brings together three main innovations. So collaborative web annotation, knowledge mapping, and visual analytics. So he has a sidebar that allows community uh, managers or civic leaders to go and annotate the civic input that could be happening in different tools, for example, on Facebook or on Twitter or on, uh, on, um, on their uh, organization web page and a couple of forums here and there, and start to highlight them and then annotate them like if they were st sticky notes that you put around the web. Then it gives you the possibility, it takes you uh, your notes into a canvas. And in this canvas, you can start connect these notes that are connected to different places and discussion places around the web and build your discussion map. So you can track a problem, for example, and see which different solution have been proposed by your constituency from different websites, what evidence could be found in support or against and start deliberating with a group of people around the, all these signals around the web. And then it provides you with a visualization dashboard that uh, help you identify what, what are the, for example, the pattern emerging, the collaboration, and so on. Uh, Lightmap is quite uh, well used, so you can access it here at lightmap.net if you are interested. The second tool is a completely different deliberation scenario, and now we are talking about the UK <laughs> and uh, engaging in the political elections. So uh, the UK and many democracies during political election, uh, they, they have in television public debates. And this is their way to engage the citizens into uh, the political debates before an election. Uh, of course, this uh, deliberation, deliberative democracy events are usually one way events because they are always uh, uh, passive uh, received watching of a winning and losing context. So we designed the tool. Uh, that wanted to engage the users, the watcher of a political election debate in a more proactive way. And they also provide them a better understanding of what was happening, how they were reacting to the debates, and, uh, and give them the sense of uh, how they were engaging them in a democratic way. So uh, democratic reflection basically uh, allow you to have a collective watching experience. Imagine you are, there is the US election debate streaming soon, and we are all watching here. So you can interact with it either with your phone or with a tablet and, uh, um, and either holding as a second screen interaction or as a video stream replay. And you will see in front of you a series of cards that basically are meant to capture things that you would like to tell to the speaker if you could. But the nice things of this uh, uh, reflective statement is that they are meant to trigger your uh, democratic entitlements. They are meant to make you reflect uh, and look at that debate, not as, again, a winning losing context, but rather in the sense of the critical democratic events that is taking place, meaning informing your vote. So you will have question how, how this relates to me. Can I trust him? Does he have how this relate? That, is, he pre, is he proposing any policy about this? Um, oh, and also you can engage emotionally. Mm, I hate this. I think this is not talking for me and so on. So uh, the interface we use for uh, the Corbyn Johnson election is this one, and it gives you just an idea that we have tested with many reflective statements. 
these are five dimension with two polarity, how they speak to you. Are they making sense? Do they, do they make me feel part of the debate? Do I find it relevant? And do you think they will make ever a difference in the political um, arena? Uh, this is the one we used uh, in the 2017 election, the seven party leader debate. And uh, you can see that here we experimented with four dimension, but this time four polarity. So two positive and two negative from very positive to very negative. Like he's speaking to us honestly, for example, or he's being elusive and manipulative or, or similarly on the other edges. After you have spent two hours clicking on this statement um, and the debate is finished, you then receive a series of reflective analytics that uh, tells you how your experience went. So you have personalized analytics that, for example, make you see how you clicked positive and negatively different for the different speakers. And then it takes the five democratic entitlement and tells you, well, look, I felt a lot respected, but they really did not engage me much. And surely they did not feel me, make me feel empowered in any way. And I don't think they will ever change the political uh, situation. Uh, you can also observe uh, the collective analytics and understand how the entire group has reacted or look at it from look at the reaction from a temporal perspective for example looking at the peaks of reaction and then go back and replay for example when there were specific peaks in which the the community out there had been for example particularly outraged by something or particularly happy about something else so really it gives you the uh, a collective democratic open experience of this um, critical uh, democratic moment. Um, this tool has been tested in the past three election in the UK and has really showed impressive results. Uh, we have tested it with the uh, with the representative, semi-representative sample of the UK population. And uh, uh, many people, most people said that the tool changed the way they, uh, they, they thought about the political leader. They said they would change, they changed some previous assumption they had before they watched the debate on how they would have voted. And it may as well in 75, I think, percent of the cases they say, they said that in my effect, I, they would have voted in the following two weeks. So now imagine if our political leader knew that there was a tool that could swing their audience, 75% of their audience, if it was used as came before an election. Uh, the third tool I want to show is a little bit in the middle. So it's a little bit like, uh, imagine, an an alternative, uh, um, an alternative uh, to Facebook or to WhatsApp, um, because it's basically a tool for large scale online deliberation, and uh, it has it looks like this, and it has three main innovation. First of all, it tried to join the argumentation structuring, uh, but also giving the linear accessibility of online discussion. So he has it built in three uh, kind of uh, ban. The central one it looks a lot like uh, a WhatsApp thread if you if you can look at it. And the second one on the left it provides you a small si synopsis um, which is dynamically update and change as a new person uh, adds something to the debate and always capture the state and progress of the debate. Uh, on the bottom part, you have sense making nuggets, which are recommendations that point your interest uh, to, uh, for example, the more contrasted idea or the idea that have been neglected and you may want to go and watch it. So, in a way, provide different entry points to the conversation. 
And on the right, you have a sort of an argument map structure of the discussion. So you, by scrolling it up and down, you can see, for example, there you have uh, one idea with a lot of uh, uh, con argument and only one pro. So you might want to go and explore it further. So it provides a source of structure navigation index on the right. Uh, and why is very different? So the main difference are that buttons there. So you see that there is, uh, um, instead of a reply button, which by the way is still present up there, but is not prominent, you have a give your opinion button that looks a lot like uh, consider it. So it gives you uh, the possibility to uh, rank, but in a very, uh, nuanced way your opinion like I somewhat agree I somewhat disagree and then it presents you to the trigger to think about the positive and negative of your own ideas in a way already nudging you to think that there is not only one way to look at what you are commenting um the second big difference is that you will not find any appreciative only commun cumulative uh, feedback so you can see there is a heart there but it's only to thank you so that the positive uh, uh, kind of uh, um, encouragement it's not uh, it's not substituted with the polar uh, the popularity dynamics that we know are very very um, uh, negative and then you can see that there is a reflect button there so instead of uh, uh, all the little faces that you can see that, by the way, are nudging you to react from a very emotional way to what you are reading, because you can either cry or smile or love. There is no nuances and it's very emotional. It's just taking you away from your rationality and drilling you into your emotion. So this is making you reflect and um, is proposing we have identified four key uh, reflection nudges that are very important for deliberative democracy. So first of all, let's not forget we are discussing a problem here. <laughs> so you think this idea should be prioritized or is completely an idea that has nothing to do with what we are trying to achieve. Um, do you think that, oh, actually I started from the third one. Then the first one is, do you think this idea is polarized or not? And uh, rank it. Do you think you can trust what has been said or not? Do you think that most people would agree with this? I am quite proud of that, by the way. <laughs> Why? Because many times our reaction are not authentic to ourselves, but they are dictated by the room we believe we are in. But many times, I will break it to you. Our view of the room we are in is wrong because we think that room is a lot against us, but it's not. So think about how wrong is all that. <laughs> so um, this nudges helps you to think and reflect on that, on the fact that your assumption, even about the group and what you might think about this and about yourself might be wrong. And how do you discover it? Because as soon as you click reflect, you are gonna see this reflective widget that is gonna then only after tell you how you sit compared to the rest of the group. And then after that, you can rethink it through and then start your reflective journey. Apart that innovation, there are also different uh, analytics that help to, to make you see things that other tools don't allow you to see. So imagine you are in a Facebook conversation, you can click a button that tells you how polarized is this conversation with 400 people. Would you click that button? I think you would. So this uh, visualization there show you exactly that. 
So it's plotting all the people, and I can do that only because these tools are argumentation structured. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a way to do it with normal social media. I can plot you that on the level of their agreement and biggest agreement with the rest of the group. So this is quite a quite a nice group because you can see it's a Gaussian. So they are very well distributed. But if you would see two pile of people on the two sides, it would take you one second to see that this is a very polarized group. And you could immediately identify what are the two groups. And if you are a civic leader and a community manager, you can start doing something about it if your objective is reconciling the group and bringing it closer together. So visual analytics allow you to reflect, to act upon the unhealthy deliberation process that quite normally will always arise. And this is it. <laughs> I think I should stop because I, I could talk for a lot. I can only tell you that there is, oh, I need, I must tell you this. Uh, we have tested the because and we had really, really great results. We hope to publish soon, um, which have demonstrated uh, that two very important things. First of all, that argumentation structuring, it does not reduce engagement, which was one <clears throat> of the things that people always argue for having people not using argumentation tool. Oh, engagement is gonna go down. Well, you know what? It doesn't actually goes up. So that is one first wrong uh, uh, disproof. <clears throat> Second, is that argumentation structure, it does not bring division. There is a stigma, a stereotype around argumentation technology, like if they are tools for arguing with each other, while actually using this technology bring people closer and the data show it. So we have analyzed it with the basically an ABC testing with the three group of 20, so 20 times three groups. And in all instances, the solution that had the reflective feedback, instead the love it, appreciative feedback, and the argumentation structuring, they reduce of a lot the platform island and they bring the network of people closer. So argumentation technology do reduce polarization <laughs> by having people disagreeing with each other. Guess what? Uh, also reflection interaction, instead of I love it and polarity interaction, they make the network much more interconnected. So they improve reciprocity. Many more people talk to many more people. And also they produce in general better connected ne network, not isolated islands. So not just in terms of, uh, of polarization, also in terms of connecting everyone else to everyone else. So what come next? I wanna tell you, this is a vibrant moment for civic technology. So you guys are in the right line of work. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, there is a lot of money <laughs> that uh, the European Union, for example, is investing into really reshaping the future of our democracy. And they are really interested in doing this with the technological support. So um, there is also for, uh, uh, for people that are interested in, uh, in social movement, I have attended this brilliant CSEW Civic Technologies Workshop in 2020 that I would recommend you to read and gives you a sense of everything that is happening around the world and in this uh, research space. Um, last thing I want to tell you is that we are now starting a new project called Orbis that will run for the next three years in which the three tools, three of, no, two of the tools that I showed today will be tested with uh, uh, basically six different use case partners around Europe. 
and actually not only uh, because a democratic reflection, but also polis, these four tools, some of the tools of, uh, of the argumentation network um, will be uh, proved and taken uh, with real community and let's see what happens. So this is the, the five main innovation we will be working on. Um, so I will be still working on into disrupting uh, with the new user experience for deliberation at all scales. So if you guys have an ideas of the different social areas where you want to innovate, just give me a shout. Um, we will look at uh, AI uh, support uh, for uh, uh, automatic and semi-automatic summarization visualization and analysis, uh, improving all the things that I have already shown. And then we are be working with uh, also some other partners in the argumentation network um, with the uh, argumentation money, mining uh, and, uh, and also uh, conflict resolution. So this is all. And uh, if you have any question, I will take them. Was I too long, Buya? Are you too bored online? Oh, there are questions. Yeah, so I think I stay here close to you. Okay. Like maybe I enter on the other side and try to collect the questions both from the virtual room and the traditional room, let's say. So I just stop sharing. Um, uh, there are already well, well, well no i think we can you can stay here i just try to i just try to make uh why they cannot see you from uh, what do you see from home ah we are here Ottimo. okay well i think it's okay like this so maybe we collect some questions very um I, we, and they just talk. Yeah, Why don't that, you talk? yeah, that's better. So I, that's what I was suggesting. That is better that you can expose your question, uh, both from the room here and from home. Uh, we have uh, more or less uh, thirty-five uh, minutes for questions and answers, and after we let uh, Anna uh, going, uh, that she arrived today. So it was a long day. If you want to hear more, hear more from um, her work and from other research uh, in the area of argumentation, I invite you to join tomorrow the uh, closing conference of the uh, cross-section. Um, sorry, is here European Network for Argumentation Public Policy Analysis at Nova University starting tomorrow, and you, I think you received all the uh, the information to our. Uh, institutional email. So if you want to look for uh, more inside this uh, this topic, you can go and uh, you also have there the link for registration. And uh, so now we collect the conf the um, the questions. And um, I already I also have two questions, but I prefer to leave the 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 um, open the floor to someone that hasn't talked. Until now? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit uh, mm -hmm. Well, okay. So the only things that can I bring up the slides? Yeah, or... sure. So the only um, there is no optimization on the way and uh, uh, on the discussion that are shown in the homepage at the moment. There is not. So it's just really like consider that this is a new technology. So I think we have. 30 debates. So you're all like, we don't, we still don't have the problem of optimization, I wish. 
we will have it soon. But, but it's a very good point. <laughs> I don't underestimate that question. Uh, and uh, in, um, can I go back? Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. The, the question about um, algorithmic recommendation, it's a very serious one um, and the contested one. So the, at the moment, everything I showed, even the reflective feedback, they have no auto, no, no intelligence, right? I'm only reshuffling, visualizing, but I don't filter out anything. I don't manipulate, I don't make decisions. I just change the experience, but I don't add anything, right? So that's, uh, and already with that, I have shown you how much better we could do. But I also have to tell you that for the first time we have tried here on the left, you see this last one now? For the first time we have tried with uh, some algorithmic support. So these two things, this synopsis and uh, this, are you familiar with the GT, GPT-3 and GPT-4? Generative, no? You should go and check it out, guys. Chat GTP3, write it down because this is going to be the future. So these are they they are large language model. Uh, take suck in a lot of text, and they are able to summarize it better in a second better than any human and any intelligent system has ever done before. It's perfectly scary. I mean, I've tried it and I that's why I was like, mm. <laughs> I thought I I thought it was the Antichrist, but then I said like, I have to try it because it's too good. <laughs> and I have to understand if it can damage. I think it's too good and it can do a lot of good, but it can damage also a lot because it's uh, this, this synopsis. I mean, really, I really recommend you to go there and look at how good they are. And they read well and they are quite accurate and they are personal. You can create prompts so that you can do it a little bit more emotional, a little bit more elegant. And in a second, you know, you can target it to the, your audience. You, it's scary, right? So we have tested it, but the problem with this is that the AI is generating the content. So unlike the old style AI technology, they are not uh, if you want, extracting intelligent pieces and presenting it to you with some level of inference, you know? No, they are creating new data. So that thing is new text. It's not that the three lines are extract from a post, then I put a little link and another extra quotes from the other post, and I can track the provenance of that text. I cannot track the provenance of that text because the machine has on its own will and intelligence link them like if he was a chef and pull out something incredibly good. <laughs> so it's a little bit the greens. <laughs> Try GTP, GPT-4, 4, 4, 4 is even scarier, it can even comment images, <laughs> honestly, it's just horrible, like you guys should really try it, it's free, go there, entry any text you want, it's gonna scare you, and then make them a hard question, like, actually, I have read this, but I disagree. Can you suggest anything particularly intriguing? It's gonna give you the best answer. You will, you're gonna say like, my friend cannot give such an intelligent answer. <laughs> but anyway, no, jokes apart, uh, this, uh, we tested this and it is, uh, it is proved that this generative approach, they cannot guarantee accuracy they create bollocks. And there are lots of um, example already in the literature that proves that 
they are often wrong. Like they can create, uh, forget about fake news. I mean, they create wrong. They they feel they are feel they can create things that don't exist. Mm -hmm. So accuracy is inexistent. So I wanted to do a test, and I said, like, okay, let me see what happens if I insert this. I don't know how good I am, but then I'm gonna do another study about discovering how good it is. I wanna see how it changes the, the social interaction being half good, because this is not even half, it's actually much more than half good, but let's say it is one third good and two third bollocks, yeah, of the summary of that conversation. But I'm gonna give it to them because at the moment they have nothing and this conversation is 40 pages. So usually people replies having read two lines with the last three posts without knowing anything of what happened before. So actually, if I go something that is one third good, maybe it's better. Well, everything improved. The, the collaboration improved, but and that is the red flag. The perception of people on the trustworthiness of the debate improved. Mm -hmm. And that is dangerous because if even being cracked, it make people believe that I can trust that, then it's a risk, isn't it? Because then if something really wrong is said. So it is an open question. Like uh, I, uh, I can tell you for certain that the addition of this synopsis, which provide newcomer with the 10 line uh, summary and especially the sense making nuggets down there, which basically what they do is uh, uh, pick a topic and ask GPT-3 to summarize the main argument. Um, they have further improved the, the things that I showed you before. It makes, it makes the network even more connected. It makes people even happier. And, we, and I have a theory of why this is happening from a, um, from a user experience, because what I think it happens is that these nuggets here are particularly important. So when the conversation is huge and people see how good are the text is the text that is there, start reading the conversation in, instead of temporarily from top to bottom or from the back to the, they start going through the nuggets. They start going through this recommendation. Sorry? Yes. Because the post, the, the nuggets are one uh, option. And then what is done, it says like, if this option has pro and con, tells you summarize this 30 pro and 30 con in four lines. So you can read the debate with a small summary and say like, oh, that's interesting. I wanna go there. So in a way, uh, it's, it's guiding your participation to what you can contribute best because this interests you. So you are going to give more. So this is just speculation, but I believe that, that the addition of entry points that are randomly, we cannot anticipate where in the linear chain are there, allow people to really get meet each other. <laughs> In, in new way and around issues they are interested on, not by seeing how many votes we are in favor of the same thing. So there is a thing about linking people through the problem and, and giving them a variety of entry points that reduces the degree of separation and then gets people talking more to each other changes the interaction but we we don't know you know like the, we have to be very careful of what we say people that summary is in fact 
I would I, that maybe we can join some more questions that uh, Merton maybe. Yeah, 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 sure. To, sure. Because if, I think that there are maybe the, the, these things can be connected to some questions yeah, that yeah, I was sure yeah. that would be. Robert. No, but no, I, but I, I can speak Italian. I, I speak for hours. He, you know, no, like you but, should come. But this, uh, you, you know should Italian, block so, me. So you know, like block me, block me. Go on. Okay. No, uh, uh, that was very. I mean, fascinating and. Uh, <clears throat> I am also doing some research on deliberation, but I'm basically I'm searching more the way of the liberty in mm. So one question that I have is whether these um, your studies are approaching how to improve or very good question. Okay. And how? Well, I mean, the other is not maybe we need to write a project together. Okay. okay. I, 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 I am very fascinated. I mean, mini public is really like the deliberative democracy innovation. Thanks God they have done something new, you know, of the century. And I love it. Um, but when you go, you know, and, and really, enter into what they are of course as a technology i'm a bit a technologist i'm a bit disappointed am i you know it's just like the structure is great the way in which they aim to achieve representativeness it's really remarkable because i mean if you don't do it that way it's very hard to be able to host a public deliberation on a topic and being able to even just claim that you have heard all the voices you had to, yeah? So I think that in a sense, I find it remarkable that they are they have found a way in which they can at least consult the right variety of people, let's put it this way. But, uh, but, I I don't think it can scale in any way because the costs are humongous. Well, yes, because it's 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 it, it it's very they are very very expensive in a way experiences. They are also very institutional base because of course who has the money so it has to be something that starts but this there is nothing bad about that but in a way it makes it limited uh in in the way in which it can also be um proposed or emerge from different communities and different and and around different problems so i think there is a space for mini public a big space for mini publics uh in in especially at the regimes like if you want you know i don't know if you are familiar with the transition you transition theory no I mean, anyway when i say regimes i i talk about formal institution no regimes as <laughs> because i can see that that, that might be a, a weird uh, term no 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 i don't mean it in that way i mean like an instit starting from institution yeah but I think uh, I think uh, public deliberation should start not only from institution. So it should start from institution, but it should start also from the grassroots and from organization on any level. So I think mini public are great if you were a government that had the right, the money and the will to do so. But if you wanted that to scale, for example, at inter-regional or international deliberation, that would not scale, right? Uh, and, uh, and if you wanted to do it at low cost, I mean, if you wanted to use some of these, these tools can reach many with zero costs. When I had to do well, you know, I could I could reach any number of people for zero money, and then I had to pay 
25k, 25,000 hero, to engage 80 people during the UK election. 80, it's zero. It's zero. Just because, you know, like when you go through mass market research company, this is what you get. So, you know, like it, it is, it is sustainable, the deliberative democracy methodology that requires so much money and therefore could be led only by organizations who have that money. So I, 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 so that is one first thing. And then the other one is that I would really like to see a little bit more of technological experimentation also into the mini public model because it's, it's all done in old style participatory methods. So all face-to-face -face, um, with the same problem of tracking and reporting of information, legitimacy of reporting, because then there are people that report about other people thing. And uh, so what's the role of the knowledge manager? You know, like it's all reiterating all the problem of old participatory practice. And there is so much more we can do technologically. So I that's why I said like, maybe we should do, we should, we should write a project about that because I, I think the concept is revolutionary and there is so much more that you can do with it to make it really democratic, cheaper, scalable. Uh, so yeah. Thanks. As we go forward, yeah, uh, what do we do in the in the graph of the existence? So this is the type, right? Mm. 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 I am looking forward to a moment in which we will not be typing anymore. So actually, because I don't know if it's you see here. Maybe, I'm already starting. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think that actually don't laugh is like my new obsession. Chat GPT <laughs> will allow also translation, like ling multilingual translation. So I believe there will be a future in which we will be able to participate in, in this conversation, first of all, without typing, but with our body and voices and also talking different language. I will be able to raise a, a question in Italian and you will reply me in Portuguese or in any other language, each one speaking its own languages, but all contributing to a coherent conversation. Now, I have not stopped, thought about XR yet. <laughs> So Googles and stuff, but I'm very fascinated. Actually, my university has invested six million to the creation of six XR pods for expensive experimenting with the most crazy idea of extended and augmented reality. So I am I will be looking at that uh, in the future, but for now, it's text and voice. And multilinguality, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I think it's great. Uh, it would be nice to overcome it because we are also doing further away from the public representation of the people that are doing it. How? I can only think about it as this being represented in Spain, but maybe there's another way. Mm. I like what it is. Mm. Mm. Very intriguing. Some from the from home, there is some question. They are sleeping. I I have a or eating or drinking. Uh -huh. Drinking it will be yeah. I I have a questions doubts uh, uh, from a well, from a sociological perspective, which I know that is sometimes conflicting with technology. Uh, not completely, but uh, well, I think that we really need to look more at what's happening. Uh, on the, the side, uh, and sometimes we are a little bit blocked by our theoretical and analytical background. You know that certain things, uh, like for instance, when you talk about collective intelligence, where collective uh, is one of the most uh, 
contentious uh, concept in uh, such a scientist and particularly in sociology and how you create a, a collective, a collective identity, which are the origin of co collective, uh, which, first of all, which is what is collective, if is uh, the, uh, the, the addition of all the individual identity or the, or the interaction of all of them, so all these questions. And in this sense, like uh, particularly from uh, uh, my era, I'm a social movement scholar, a civil society, society scholar, uh, the idea of, uh, so in this case, you see the plot, the, the collective intelligence is created in that very moment by the by the tool in a certain way. So and uh, and in, in so which is the which is the role of interactive process? Also because it's very uh, interesting for me that when you mention uh, the so the, it seems to me that there is the the, the there is no uh, kind of meso level between the individuals and the big collective intelligence. Which is exactly the level that I studied, that are the networks, the groups. Uh, and when you mention this, like, ah, when you arrive to express your position there as an individual, you don't know, but do you have your, your embedded in your groups and networks, etc.? And for me, it's exactly this is interesting the embed, the fact that you're embedded, and which is from, so from social poly political sociological perspective, is not uh, exactly wrong or negative, or the theory about civil society and groups. Uh, is something positive that we are in well we cannot do any in other way but it's also positive to have uh, to be embedded in networks and groups etc because they are creating our um, positions etc so uh, what's the role of this background so you see this as a negative thing because uh, what so the, the, collective? the fact that you arrive uh, that your position is not to uh, say you, when you arrive there express your position you think that maybe it's just your position but actually you are constantly natural for other people. So what you reflect in your position is also the re result of this, uh, uh, your uh, fact of be, being embedded in networks, uh, which for you is something negative. For me as a sociologist, something positive. Oh, because no, this I is don't think that civil society. Oh, no, 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 no. I, no. I, I mean, then I did not, did not explain myself. No, no, is that good? Uh, sorry. Say? No, 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 no. It's absolutely not negative. Actually, I mean, the whole purpose of these technologies is to have uh, a way for people to uh, to become closer and more aware mm -hmm. of of other people and position and frame their own position being connected. That's why they are collective intelligence approaches and radically different from many collective intelligence approaches that are crowdsource base so basically in in collective intelligence there are two main approaches one is very um uh it goes like this so the collective intelligence is created by the tool as you said so basically individual contributors contribute to something then the tool aggregates the individual contribution and propose the solution, the solution is taken. So basically, in this type of collective intelligence crowdsourcing approach, it has been demonstrated that if people talk to each other, the collective intelligence goes down, which is scary. So, so basically, imagine that there is a problem like um, uh, forecast if the price of gold in the next six months is going to grow all going to go up and down or down. You take this question, you give it to 3 million people, you aggregate the answer, make a rough mean, get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Then you make the same experiment, same question, you allow people to talk to each other and debate. Do the same, do the forecast, wrong answer. So a lot of collective intelligence approaches enforce lack, enforce not communication between the individual contributor. That's something a lot of people don't know about crowdsourcing. They don't have to talk to each other. Of course, you can see how these type of approaches, they don't work for public deliberation. They might work for tame problems that have one prediction point and an, an absolute solution, 
but they cannot work for complex problem in which the future is not established, is negotiated. We are changing it. We are building it while talking to each other, so we can change the outcome. Yeah, where the engagement is so important it's not, than the result. No. Exactly. No. Exactly. Exactly. And any collective intelligence of the collective comes from learning and improvement and understanding and, and getting, as Levi said, to higher level of the community and society. And in these type of approaches, you need to talk to each other. And that's that's why this discourse-based collective intelligence approaches look at how we do it, but bringing people to talk to each other. And they are radically, philosophically, very different the from crowdsourcing. Huh? There is the creation of groups or groups are the kind of the F, the, the meso level between the result the so there are these discussions the a lot of the visualization I maybe mean, you would yeah. be interested to look at that I, I i don't do anything about group creation because i'm just giving the results to people to reflect these for me are just reflecting tool but sure. probably groups are creating all sorts of groups probably yeah. there will be different groups if you observe a topic different yeah, groups exactly. if you this so there are i'm sure that there will be plenty of groups but no the tool doesn't enforce any grouping in a way it's just like joining the discussion or not mm -hmm. but i i didn't i didn't mean to say that i believe that interchange or group is or networking is wrong no no the, 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 the background the, the, the position we arrive at that point is already of course we is not just there our position from individual in that moment but it's also influenced about by our background and family and groups and friends etc and these of course and it's not necessarily negative it's, it's normal that it's, no, no, yeah no. yeah yeah of course yeah. it was just a comment on this mm -hmm. in some situations maybe you can have the best of the both words because like in the reviewing, I can ask both of you to review independently. I give you the paper, you don't communicate. I get the two independent reviews, and that's like, oh, let's all discuss. Yeah. So you could maybe that, some that, point integrate something. There is a, a great tool called Cicero. You should watch. I know. Do you know Cicero? I don't know why, but I know. Well, you know, he's just, this guy's amazing. Anyway, so he's doing some of this uh, experiment with the different facing of uh, the interaction and i think that has a lot of promise but because we need there are certain things that we are better at doing in isolation like reflecting like changing ourselves our assumption that's why in the first meeting of the apply i loved so much the keynote of the australian guy because we also need to deliberate within not only between us so I think that we need to experiment with experience, deliberation experience that allow spaces for internal private reflection and learning, but also then collective exchange. Sure. Because it's, it's true that there are certain things that could work better if aggregate in isolation and by the way crowdsourcing uh, crowdsourcing method works really well for certain other type of problem i'm not saying that they don't work well but they i believe they are not the right approaches for public deliberation and uh, and 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 wicked problem socio technical problems i think they are more appropriate for other types of problems
And then you pay me, you know, like 10 euros in one hour or whatever it's the salary, 25. Oh. Just kidding. But yeah. It's like, yeah. We're not going to make anyone pay. The money is not going to be in my system and ever. Then you have very weird number of people, those who are prone to just getting some kind of abusive discussion. I'm not going to be there. No, no, you have a very good point. No, 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 I, yeah, it's a very good point. How, how can you solve this? The temptation problem So recently, it's such a great question because recently I have, I'm just thinking about this concept. Well, it's not that recent, it's a while that is in my brain of minimal meaningful participation that's how i call it i think we need to find that sweet spot of minimal engagement deliberative engagement so that they don't become too costly for the user because the users are really very busy and all this civic stuff it's all on a volunteer base all the time all the time, all the time. So we're not gonna make it scale ever if it's so expensive from the perspective of the participant. So I'm always thinking, can I design a effective deliberation experience, which is timely and short and democratic reflection is going in that direction because it's life is only in the moment and it require you you can do it as short as you want. I have tested it now, even with one minute interaction. But now what I'm thinking I would like to test is more complex mini deliberation. So not just interaction, but really like deliberation. So I don't know if you have uh, come across this tool called Unanimous AI. No, oh, it's a genius. This is my, but this is the next thing. <laughs> It's great, like you can make a complex decision in three minutes. <laughs> well, with a lot of people, the they find they found this way. Yeah. But Next time you see you're gonna be divorced. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is that it's not perfect. It's not that you do it, it's just the decision. It's just the decisional moment, right? It's not all the deliberation. We we cannot do all of it in three minutes, okay? But even just the decision moment is the hardest. Large organizations usually devote a lot of money to do participatory project consultation of three years that takes lots of money. And then when it gets to the decision, it's too late and they make it in the crappy way they would have done it in the, at the beginning because there is no way so to- deciding and after to, participating. That's what Yeah. <laughs> so it, there is we should but what i'm trying to say is that we can take the deliberation um process and imagine can we can this be combined with many timely deliberation experiences that people can combine in different way so that they at their own need can participate I think that has to be the way because it sounds like people think about it not being like a good point on think about it for two minutes or whatever. Yeah. That's it. And Pocket that's of small interaction that can yeah. contribute at different phases of deliberation, you know, like idea creation, you know, like and then idea assessment, filtering, reducing idea, opening up, closing down, you know, like. But you can do different experience and make them short. I think making that short will be very important because time is everything. I think. Yeah. Just a civic. So having recently been married, I can tell you that people that they and mm -hmm. but the ethical problem is this: so if I try to date something with my wife, the problem to date is that I would probably say, "Please, can you use it?" 
<laughs> yeah. It's a great idea. <laughs> I'm processing, but yeah, why not? I can. I. I think. We don't have the, the privacy space, space, the privacy spaces will have to be defined. I uh, one, one door that I didn't want to open is uh, this door of um, data ethics and privacy in public deliberation. It's a huge door. I mean, like, I don't want to open it now before dinner, but it <laughs> is, it is, it is a yeah. big deal because um, where does where does your right starts and finishing and finishes to protect your information while you are contributing to the collective good right it's just a, it's a very it's a very it's a very hard question and uh, and and I don't know if there is a right answer. I, just, I don't know what we will decide. But I feel that um, at the moment we are doing it in the wrong way possible. Like we are doing it on social media, where we have zero protection or control of our very sensitive data, right? So. I'm sure everything hurts is better than that. Huh? Everything hurts is better than that. Already. Yeah, I think so. But you know, like I think that it is worth looking at. Uh, there, is, there are a lots of researchers looking. Not not my field. Looking at data sovereignty and you know, like different sorts of distributed ledger blockchain approaches to uh, to this and provide solutions that at the moment in theory are there but they haven't been adopted yet but i think it is something that we owe to to do at some point if we really want to use technology in the public sphere in a in a way that is legitimate and fair to everyone and respects individual but also collective rights because we never talk about the collective rights yeah okay so i think we can uh, conclude here thank you to the 13 participants remaining. who stayed remaining. yeah yeah resistant let's see where are they Okay. You click on participant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Anna, for this. Uh, no, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope we will have you here more time because uh, for sure it will be very interesting for us. And thank you for joining us today. And we, uh, the next uh, seminar will be, I think, 20th of April, but you will receive information. So let me see if someone say something in the chat. Ciao, ciao. Thank you very much for coming and joining us. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. I close. Ik heb wel eens een keer een nacht, maar